Please welcome Susan Jacoby. Well, thank you all. I, first thing I want to do is thank you for coming to this conference and for coming out so early uh, to the conference, which is intended to address an importance that I think is of great importance for the future of the secular movement, but one that makes many secularists and atheists uncomfortable. Looking around this room, you'd think that there is no woman problem in the secular movement and in organizations dedicated to the promotion of secular values. But as someone who speaks about these subjects, specifically America's secular history, to many different kinds of audiences, I can assure you that there is a problem. When I speak before non-college audiences, that is, audiences in which no one was required to be there to get credit for a college course, 75% <laughs> of the people in the seats are always men. Now, the good news is that this is a significant improvement over where things were when I began speaking on these topics eight years ago, when my book, Free Thinkers, was published. At that time, I would say my audiences were about 90-10 male to female. But the bad news is the gender gap in this movement remains as large as it is, as vi and as visibly as it does, although it's less striking, far less striking, among people under 30. The question is why? Uh, the first and most obvious reason is that women in the United States and every other country are more religious and more devout in their practice of their religion than men. Public opinion polls show that this disparity affects every income, educational, and racial group, although it is much narrower among the highly educated and among the young than among the old. African-American women, regardless of their level of education, are among the most religious demographic in this country. This fact alone tells us that education is not the decisive factor, because although black women as a group are better educated than black men, black men are less religious. The question of why women are more religious than men is going to come up again at a panel discussion I'm moderating this afternoon, so I'm going to leave this subject for now and simply note that the greater religiosity of women means that atheism in particular is a tougher sell to women, and that this results in a shallower pool when it comes to female participation and leadership in the secular movement. However, religious democracy is far from the, demography is far from the only reason for this phenomenon. The very question of why women are more religious than men often makes very visible prejudices that could very well deter younger women atheists from becoming involved in secular activities. When I first began writing for the On Faith section of the Washington Post, one of the earliest questions posed to the panel was, what accounts for women's greater religiosity? An amazing number of men on my blog answered baldly, you should excuse the expression, uh, because women are stupider than men. <laughs> I, I, this surprises you? I, I, think mo <laughs> I think most of us can agree without parsing SAT and IQ scores that this is not exactly a reason and evidence-based answer. Uh, it represents the so-called thinking of a group of modern-day social Darwinists who do make up one component of the secular movement. A good many of them, as I was to find out when I wrote the Spirited Atheist column for several years, are dedicated to a worldview in which not only are men smarter than women, but whites are smarter than blacks, and Asians are smarter than either whites or blacks, and anyone who challenges these beliefs is dismissed as politically correct. These were the same angry white guys who would often call me Susie in their comments. <laughs> uh, Interestingly, the religious right-wingers on the blog simply referred to me as an ugly old atheist. Uh, <laughs> apparently, the social Darwinist boys were under the impression that using a diminutive would make any woman burst into tears and perhaps hand over her column to them. Uh, <laughs> while, while the religious right thinks that calling you ugly or old is the worst possible insult. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, in part because I place about as much value on anonymous opinions expressed on blogs as I do on professions of eternal love after drinking the night away in a bar. Uh, <laughs> however, 
I don't think it can be denied that the idea that women aren't as, shall we say, tough-minded as men has long been held by an element in the secular movement, including the 20th century movement as it developed after World War II, a period when misogynist attitudes were, as we all know, more pervasive in American culture than they are today. Now, this misogyny sometimes rears its head today as a distinction between so-called soft and hard atheists, with people like my friend Sam Harris being described as a hard atheist because he believes and has frequently written that so-called moderate religion is even worse than fundamentalist religion because moderate religion provides a respectable cover for the more extreme forms of fundamentalism. Speaking only for myself and, and not certainly for womankind, I don't agree with Sam about this. I think, frankly, that the job of the secular movement would be a lot easier if American religion consisted only of liberal Protestantism, Reformed Judaism, and the kind of liberal Catholicism that tells the Catholic bishops just where they can stick their doctrines. Uh, <laughs> So does that make me a soft atheist, a kinder, gentlest, gentler atheist, as the religious historian Stephen Prothero once described me to my dismay? I resent that. I refuse to be called kind and gentle by anybody. Uh, <laughs> But I also think it's nonsense, since I know all sorts of male atheists who agree with me on this issue, and all sorts of women who agree, disagree with Sam and Richard Dawkins in their characterization of all religion. Uh, what this silly distinction does, however, is it characterizes a genuine reasonable disagreement, one as much about tactics as principle, as a difference between the sexes. Because what's really being said here is that because you may disagree with me on an intellectual issue, you're soft, a word that's synonymous with flabby and weak-minded, and you're soft because you're a girl. When I was writing The Spirited Atheist, I was often challenged to def defend some statement by Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, and the point I always made is that one of the major differences between atheism and religion is that no atheist is obliged to agree with every single thing another atheist says. Richard Dawkins is not the Pope. Sam Harris is not a cardinal. The late Christopher Hitchens is not the Holy Ghost. And... <laughs> and and I am most definitely not a nun. <laughs> now, I'm in my 60s, and calling me soft, or even Susie, is not exactly going to crush my spirit or, pre or persuade me that it's time to repent and join some church. But this kind of stereotyping is not likely to have a welcoming effect on young women atheists many of them who are now still on the fringes of the secular movement. My two nieces are both in their 20s and they're both atheists, but they're not at all involved in organized secularism. They consider this a rather quaint activity of Aunt Susan's, only to be expected of the generation that came of age in the 1960s, a decade which, of course, they're understandably sick of hearing about. Uh, looking back further historically, it's just a fact that a great many founders of 20th century secular organizations, like the Center for Inquiry, came from either philosophy or science backgrounds. And these two areas of academia were particularly hospitable to women, inhospitable to women before the 1980s. I should also point out that the very few women in the 50s and early 60s who were professionally engaged in either philosophy or science had to work twice as hard as men to maintain themselves professionally. And they really didn't have time to become involved in a marginalized secular movement that as far as they could see had no direct impact on their lives and their prospects. And when things began to change in the late 60s and early 70s, a lot of the energies of the smartest and most energetic women of my generation went into the feminist movement, which did directly affect our everyday lives. I've been an atheist since I was 15, but I simply saw this as something I was, not as something I would have wanted to invest any of my energies in as a writer, and my being a writer was, was and in fact still is my main concern. Uh, looking at this from the historical perspective of my generation as we came of age, I must also mention the seemingly anomalous fact 
that the best known atheist in America in the late 50s and 60s was Madeline Murray, known as Mad Madeline to her detractors. She later married a man named O'Hare and took his last name, something I found quite curious at a time when women were beginning to keep their last names. At the time, Murray stood almost alone in her willingness to call herself an atheist. Now, she had not, for the most part, said anything more abrasive to Christians than Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens have. But let's not forget that she was saying it at a time that atheism was more demonized than it is now, and she was a woman. She frequently described religion as lunacy and silliness, and the fact that she was a woman made it much easier for the rest of society to dismiss her as a nutcase. In a speech at the University of Maryland in 1961, she mocked people like Vashti McCollum, uh, another extremely important but less well-known woman in the 20th century history of American secularism, because McCollum called herself a humanist instead of an atheist. McCollum was the plaintiff in McCollum versus the Board of Education of the State of Illinois, a 1948 case which struck down the then common practice of release time for religious instruction for public school students. Murray, however, was very contemptuous of people who described themselves as humanists. She told the U of Maryland students that she was an atheist, quote, not an agnostic, not a rationalist, not a realist, nor humanist, nor any of the other fancy names behind which people must hide in our society in order to be safe in our society. Of course, Murray was right about the prejudice against the word atheist, but she antagonized many people who did call themselves secular humanists because of her insistence that only atheists could serve as an honorable self-definition. In any case, along with her son and granddaughter, she would meet an Anne Gr Grizzly enough to satisfy the severest Calvinist. She disappeared in 1995, and her burned and dismembered body was finally found on a remote ranch in 2001. One of the prime suspects in her murder was a former office manager whom she fired for stealing $14,000 from the American Atheists Association. In another symbolic twist, lovely again for Calvinists, her one surviving child, William, became a right-wing Christian evangelist. Uh, in any case, Murray was a plaintiff in one of several cases that ultimately ultimately led to the Supreme Court striking down school prayer in 1963. But she's become a kind of embarrassment in the history of American atheism. You'll find a lot of atheist websites that try to downgrade her role in school prayer cases, whereas Vashti McCollum, whose case was equally important, has often just been ignored. In general, when women have made real contributions to the secular movement, they haven't been adequately recognized. The reason I emphasize Murray is that the reaction to her in the 60s did have something to do with her being a woman, uh, and particularly the kind of in-your-face, not conventionally feminine-seeming woman she was. She didn't look like Gloria Steinem, whose appearance, don't let anyone tell you up otherwise, had a lot to do with making feminism acceptable to young women. And Murray also did not have an acceptably feminine manner of delivery. She was not a kinder, gentler atheist. Atheists to this day are accused of being shrill, but shrill seems shriller when it's a woman speaking. As a Massachusetts newspaper wrote in the 1850s of Ernestine Rose, a Jewish immigrant from from Poland, who is another overlooked female figure in the history of American atheism, quote, we know of no object more disturbing of contempt, loathing, and abhorrence than a female atheist. We hold the vilest strumpet from the stews to be by comparison respectable, unquote. As it happens, one of the most important and long-lasting atheist organizations, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, was founded in 1976 by Annie Laurie Gaylor and her mother, Ann Nicole Gaylor. I'm sure we'll hear some of Annie Laurie's thinking on this subject during the afternoon panel I'm moderating. But the Freedom From Religion Foundation and its activities were not nearly as well known as Murray uh, at a time when the media nearly focused, always focused on what it could portray as antisocial atheist activities. I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't know much about the Freedom From Religion Foundation until 2004 when they gave me their Free Thought Heroine of the Year Award. And when I told a man who is a well-known figure in the secular movement uh, she shall remain anonymous, that I was receiving this award, he said, and I quote, the Gaylor women have done a lot for this movement, 
by showing that a female atheist doesn't have to look and sound like a shrill bitch. Unquote. He considered this a compliment. Now, it's not surprising that within the secular movement, which after all is not some sort of alien entity divorced from the rest of society's beliefs, that some secular men also hold these beliefs. This, of course, was also a double whammy that affected many feminists. They were described as man-haters and as women who hated men because they couldn't get one. Another longer-term reason for the lack of visibility of women in the entire history of American secularism is the conscious effort that has always been made to deny the essentially secular nature of women's rights movements, beginning in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. Now, in recent years, we've become familiar with the phenomenon of religion trying to take credit for all progressive movements in American cultural history. There's no denying that religion, certain kinds of religion, played a vital role in the abolitionist and civil rights movement. But we know very well that religion, like the rest of the institutions of American society, was, di was always divided, first on the issue of slavery and later on civil rights. One of the most gru more gruesomely comical phenomena of the past 20 years has been the spectacle of leaders of the religious right in the South trying to take credit for the civil rights movement, as if most Southern Protestant churches, the church always being one of the most segregated institutions in this country, had not fought bitterly against civil rights in the 50s and 60s and drummed out of their ministry those who disagreed with them. So, Nevertheless, we can look back on the leadership of the black church and Dr. Martin Luther King, and we can't pretend that religion was unimportant to the civil rights movement, but King also welcomed secularists. His best white friend was a New York Jew, uh, and, uh, and a Jewish atheist, uh, uh, but trying to downgrade the importance of King's kind of religion in the civil rights movement is as ridiculous in its own way as trying to turn Pope Pius XII into an anti-Nazi leader and a candidate for sainthood. Uh, however, whatever religion ro role religion played in civil rights, it never played an important role in the women's rights movement. Orthodox religion has always been the staunchest enemy of women's rights. And unconventionally religious women, like the great Quaker Lucretia Mott, were often accused of being atheists when they spoke out against discrimination against women. So, by the way, were the Quaker sisters Angelina and Sarah Grimke, who in the 1830s took the then unheard of step for a woman uh, of, of talking about this in public. Uh, when the Grimtees began talking about the rapes of slaves by their masters, the state Congregationalist ministers in Massachusetts issued a public condemnation of women speaking to be read from every pulpit. The letter read in part, and I must read this, it's priceless. We appreciate the unostentatious prayers and efforts of women in advancing the cause of religion at home and abroad, in Sabbath schools, in leading, in leading religious inquirers to their pastors for instruction, and in all such associated efforts, as becomes the modesty of her sex. But when she assumes the place and tone of man as a public reformer, her character becomes unnatural. Later in the 19th century, we know this only because of the research conducted during the second wave of feminism in the 1970s and 1980s, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was written out of the women's suffrage movement after she published her Woman's Bible in 1892, a compilation of criticism by female scholars of the upholding of male superiority in the Bible. And please excuse me for a second. I'm, my throat's getting dry and I failed to pour myself some water in advance, no doubt because I'm a disorganized woman. <laughs> Ah, okay. Uh, uh, it was thought, even by uh, Stanton's comrade-in-arms, Susan B. Anthony, herself an agnostic, that if the suffragist movement were perceived as anti-religious, it would never get the male support it need, needed. The downgrading of Stanton was the price exacted by the Women's Christian Temperance Union for joining the suffragist movement. 
Uh, a year after the Women's Bible became an international bestseller, the Suffrage Association passed a resolution disavowing the book and in effect one of the two most important founders of their movement. Stanton was a close friend of Robert Ingersoll, who was known as the great agnostic and was without question the leading free thinker in 19th century America. Now Ingersoll's commitment to women's right and his de denunciation of religion as one of the chief imprisoners of women made him very unusual among male free thinkers of his generation. His 20th century biographers failed to recognize, probably because most of them were writing before the 1970s, that Ingersoll held a radical view of women's rights and wrongs that went far beyond the suffragist movement of his time. In the battle over the subjugation of women, he sided with Stanton rather than Anthony, uh, who saw the vote, vote as the total remedy for all of women's ills. Like Stanton, Ingersoll viewed the franchise as necessary but not sufficient for women to become the helpmate, become the masters of their own lives. In this, he resembled feminists of the 70s and 1980s rather than the suffragists of his own time. Ingersoll was well aware that women as a group were more religious than men, than as now. But in sharp contrast to Victorian moralists who considered the female sex purer than the male, he attributed feminine religiosity not to women's higher nature, but to her lack of education and utter economic dependency on her husband. Uh, in his preference to the prominent free thinker and feminist Helen Gardner's Men, Women, and Gods in 1885, Ingersoll said flatly, woman is not the intellectual inferior of man. She has lacked not mind, but opportunity. There were universities for men before the alphabet had been taught to women. At the intellectual feast, there was no place for wives and mothers. Even now, they sit at the second table and eat the crusts and the crumbs. The schools for women at the present time are just far enough behind those for men to, uh, for, to fall heirs to, the, to the, the principle that when a doctrine becomes too absurd for the pulpit, it's given to the Sunday school. Even worse in Ingersoll's opinion was the tendency of many husbands to regard religion as the guardian of their wives' fidelity and their daughters' chastity. These men think of priests as detectives in disguise, Ingersoll said, and regard God as a policeman who prevents elopements. <laughs> uh, I think this is important because I don't think we have any Ingersolls today who speak up for women's rights in as fervent a manner as Ingersoll did then. Uh, in any case, even after passage of the 19th Amendment, the generation of suffragists that censured Stanton continued to deny a role in the movement. The amendment was named after Anthony, although Stanton was the first to propose it. In 1973, a ceremony to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention, which had been organized by Stanton and Mott and which Anthony did not even attend, included endless tributes to Anthony and no mention of Stanton. As recently as 1977, when female runners carried a torch from Seneca Falls, to a meeting in observance of International Women's Day in Houston, Stanton was still, still treated as an unperson. Anthony's grandniece was on the dais, but no descendant of Stanton's had been invited. And you had to go a long way to manage that because Stanton had eight children. <laughs> Only in the 1980s did Americans rediscover Stanton because by then the second wave of feminism had refocused attention on the issue that Stanton and Ingersoll were among the first to recognize, which was the need for women to change their view of themselves. Now, there are many religious feminists today, and they have fought for equal treatment of women within their faiths, something that does not interest me, but understandably interests them. But these women were the result, not the cause, of the 20th century feminist movement. Even so, there's been something of a tendency even on the, on the part of feminists to downplay the role of secular women in the feminist movement. Every one of us is old, who is old enough to remember knows that secular women in the 70s were disproportionately represented among leaders of the feminist movement. But it's not talked about or written about much because of course that's one of the main accusations that the religious right has leveled against feminism. It's godless. 
Well, not all feminist women are godless today, but a godless woman is more likely to be a feminist than not. Although there are exceptions, Ayn Rand, the great heroine of the far right, which is willing to overlook her atheism, was extremely misogynist in her views. Just, and if you'd like to see a good example of it, just, just, just catch The Fountainhead in a late, late movie and watch the scenes of, of Rand's female heroine admiring the drill the drilling of Gary Cooper, Cooper, duh. <laughs> it's just really ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> the restoration of secular women to the history of various social movements is, I think, essential to attracting more young women into our ranks, but that alone isn't enough. And I'm going to have to abbreviate this because I do want to leave time for questions and I've been given a kind of strict limit so I won't speak too much longer. There is, let's just admit it, a real division between secular humanists and secular conservatives, something that would surprise the religious right, which considers all, all atheists secular socialists. As I told you, they've just written Ayn Rand's atheism out of her biography. In the Center for Inquiry, the organization with which I'm most familiar, this often expresses itself as a division between humanists and people who call themselves skeptics. Now, there is a lot of overlap between these two groups, but in my experience, the skeptics tend to be more conservative and more male-oriented. I've been invited only once to speak at an event put on by people who call themselves skeptics, but I'm constantly being invited to speak before humanist groups. And there's another related problem bearing especially on the ability of the secular movement to attract young women. Uh, this is the overwhelming identification today of economic conservatism with religious conservatism within the Republican Party. I think it would be easier to attract young women if issues of church and state really were nonpartisan. There was a time dating back to the 19th century when they were, but that time is not now. The kind of economic libertarians like the late Senator Barry Goldwater, who were staunch supporters of separation of church and state, have no home in the Republican Party today. And even libertarians like Ron Paul are now tied to religious conservatism. So, so it's going to be difficult to convince young women that, that there, isn't, there aren't partisan issues around this because the, the, the real problem about, about politically conservative secularists is this. What they maintain is the government has no right, for instance, to pass financial right regulation, but it does have the right to pass laws affecting our right to use contraceptives. It doesn't wash for me. I'm, I'm not saying this is absolute, but it is a problem, and it's one that secularists do not like to acknowledge. And I will tell you that as an organizer for secular events, which I did some time for the Center for Inquiry in New York, I came to see rather quickly that uh, male attendance at events focusing on what was perceived as women's issues were very low. Were, was very low. And look around the room. Uh, you don't, there are not very many men here, and I'm, not, and I'm not surprised. Because one of the first events I organized was a panel on women's rights as human rights, something that's a key issue, obviously, for all secularists. And it was the worst attended event we ever had that year. There were only two men there. Uh, this conference is a wonderful thing, but it also shows that we have a long way to go before women's rights are fully taken for granted as one of our issues. Uh, so I think the status of women within the Islamic theocratic world is a major secular issue. And secularists are in a better position to emphasize this than liberal or conservative religious people because religious people are stuck with pretending that what happens to places, women in places like Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia, to take two very different examples, has nothing perish the thought to do with true religion. The religious right, which is so keen on painting all Muslims with the same brush, has a real problem with this issue, and we should be constantly pointing that out. A few weeks ago, I debated Dinesh D'Souza in Grand Rapids, where he accused me of suffering from, quote, anti-religious dementia, unquote, which is apparently a new psychiatric diagnosis. 
But listen to what D'Souza says in his execrable book, The Enemy at Home, in which he assigns the cultural left the responsibility for 9-11. The left is responsible for 9-11, first, because it has fostered a decadent American culture that angers and repulses traditional societies. In addition, it is waging an aggressive global campaign to undermine the traditional family and to promote secular values on in non-Western cultures. Yes, to undermine the traditional right family, to undermine the right to throw acid on little girls who want to attend school, the right of women to keep driving, the, the right to, uh, the right to uh, have legal recourse uh, for, for honor killings committed against women who marry somebody against the, uh, the, the family's wishes. Uh, so, and this also applies to issues at home in which right-wing Christian values are used to limit women's opportunities. I'm talking not only about big issues like the Catholic Church's claim that it has the right to spend taxpayer money exactly as it pleases, but about smaller, more everyday life issues. Only last week, a high school in Arizona won a state baseball championship by default because a Catholic academy, the other state finalist, refused to compete with the team because it had a 15-year-old girl, horrors, playing second base. The Catholic school statement cited religious reasons for refusing to compete, asserting that the possibility of physical contact say a hard slide into second base, <laughs> would have prevented the school from imbuing boys with the deep, religiously based respect toward all women that was one of its values. This is just a modern version of the religious justifications used for denying equal rights to women for millennia. You can't play with us little girls, our religion says so. I think it would be very good for our chapters to be involved in issues like this at the state and at the local level. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Again, I'm skipping a lot because I want to open this up for questions. Uh, a lot of the issues being highlighted at this conference need to be moved into our general conferences, but I think it's important right now, I can't think of anything more important than the education in reason of the next generation. And this is something that can draw on the traditional role of women as family educators to meet these new needs. It was Ernestine Rose who argued in 1853 against the pseudoscientific idea that there is some sort of a God gene. No, she said, religion is the result of indoctrination, not a natural propensity to believe the unbelievable. A child may be may made to believe in a falsehood and die in support of it, Rose said, and therefore there can be no merit in mere belief. Throughout the entire world, children are made to believe in the creed in which they are brought up, end quote. I think this is also, it's a general secular issue and it is a women's issue and we need more women on our front lines right now. Thank you. And now I'm gonna open this up to questions. The questions. Okay, everybody can hear. All right, great. Thank you, Susan. It was a great talk. Okay, first question I have: What are the symptoms of anti-religious dementia? Mm. <laughs> well. First of all, a craving for chocolate at times when you would otherwise be in church on Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, disagreeing with anything a minister or a bishop or a cardinal or a pope says. Uh, I guess the Vatican thinks the nuns are suffering from anti-religious dementia now. And uh, let's see, what else? Hmm. Wearing, wearing clothes that show the shape of your body. That's it too. Okay, those are three. <laughs> Why are so many, not all, but many seculars so dogmatic, almost to the point of extreme rudeness? Sometimes this feels the same as the treatment I get from the dogmatic Christian religious fanatics. Can't free thinkers use their intelligence to be open and kind? 
Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a provocative question. Uh, First of all, I mean, there are dogmatic secularists, there are dogmatic atheists. If, if by dogmatic you mean that there are some secularists, and there are, who basically treat people who are religious as stupid, and that, that isn't true, and I think that, 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 I think that is a bad tack for the secular movement, not because I am kind and gentle, but because nobody responds to being told that they are stupid. Uh, and furthermore, it cannot be true. If in fact all religious people were stupid, and stupidity was the thing that, distri that distinguishes the religious from the secular, we really would not have a problem. Uh, I don't think the pope is stupid. I think in fact he's an educated intellectual, and he's using, he's using his kind of education to further his antediluvian beliefs. But I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that, that, that giving the impression that you think people are stupid it's a very good, it's not a very good tactic, even if you think so. And I think even if you think so, your own intelligence is limited. Oh, there are all kinds of really stupid ideas that are held by people who aren't uh, intrinsically, intrinsically stupid. And I'd like to, I'd like to uh, amplify this a little bit without, uh, yes, there are secularists who are dogmatic, but, but some people say all secularists are dogmatic just because they don't like what we're saying. Uh, that's something else. I would speak a little differently, for instance, to an audience at Augustana, a Lutheran college, than I would here, because I know that I'm speaking to an audience in which most of the people are, agree with me and are not shocked by the ideas that I'm expressing. But I remember once when I gave a speech at Augustana, this is really eight years ago, and it's a very, a very nice young man who was a freshman there. It's a historical Lutheran college. But like many religious colleges, like Georgetown, for example, uh, it provides an education that p their parents often think is religious, but really isn't, because religious colleges, so unlike like Liberty University, I'm not counting, but historically religious colleges run by intelligent people often provide a lot of courses and instructors who challenge the fundamentalist religious beliefs of their students. So this young man came up to me. He said, well, he had wanted to be a minister, but a year at Augustana had convinced him that that wasn't his vocation anymore, and he wanted to be a high school teacher. But he said to me something that I remember and for which I didn't really have an answer for. He said, I understand everything you're saying how vital the separation of church and state is to all Americans, whether believers or non-believers. But he said, I believe I have the absolute truth. How can I not believe that that is not a gift rather to rather than imposition on other people? Now, this is not a stupid question. It really actually is at the heart of the fundamentalist problem. But you sure don't get anywhere with somebody like that by saying that's stupid. And, and I'm not sure it is. From the standpoint of a believer whose ideas are bounded by not being able to think that what they've been taught all their lives isn't true, it's not stupid. So I'm gonna stop right there because I know there are lots of other questions. I'm way over here. The next question, do you think women who are secular are seen as immoral because they are believed to be hedonists? Furthermore, isn't it the case that it is more acceptable for a man to be a hedonist? Well, I think, look, uh, the connection between the idea of the irreligious woman and the strumpet, I mean, I, that quote I read you was from 1853. It's very old, this idea that women unbounded by religious restrictions will just go crazy with, with, with sex. And certainly in Judaism and, in Judaism and Christianity, where a, a lot of the primitive teachings to the kids that sort of imply that, uh, that the, sin, the first sin was sex when it wasn't, it was pride and desire for knowledge, which is just as bad. But I think the, asso the association between the unboundedness of women by religion and sexuality and uncontrolled sexuality, it's very old, it's very strong, 
it ha has been, as I mentioned in regard to the feminist movement, it has been applied to women in movements other than, other than uh, anti-religious movements. It was certainly applied to feminists. In fact, it was, there was always a contradiction in the attack on feminist women because on the one hand, they were attacked for being not cute enough. Uh, they were feminist because they couldn't get a guy. And on the other, they were attacked for being feminist because they just wanted to throw over everything else, burn their bras and have all the sex that they wanted. So they would have it both ways. I think of, of course these issues are always easier for men and not only, not only for secular men. The, by, by hedonism, I assume you mean, uh, you mean sex. <laughs> they are easier for men, of course. Okay, I'm going to combine sort of the next three questions, comments, because they're all very related. One says, I think men aren't here because there's no obvious welcome or need for their participation. Why isn't there a speaker on specifics of what can men do to welcome women? And then we also have a how do we increase men's attendance at events and panels that address women's issues? And then finally, as a skeptic and a man, I agree there's an imbalance of gender in the skeptics movement. I wish there were more of both here. But I think there was a deliberate decision to make this meeting attractive to women humanists. All of those are kind of related. Do you have any comments on that? Okay, well, uh, first of all, I was not criticizing the organizers of this conference. And I don't think that the gender balance here would be any different if there was a speaker on what men can do to make secular organizations more welcoming to women. Although that might be a, might have been a good subject for a speech, but it's not why there aren't a lot of men here. Uh, I have to say that a lot of men see these issues as it would be nice to have more women in the secular movement, but it's not a very big primary issue. And I do think that, I, I think that this conference is a good start in this respect. First of all, it's the first of its kind. I really commend you and Melody uh, Hensley for organizing this. I think it can serve as a jumping off point. But some of these panels belong in regular conferences. Uh, in other words, the conferences which are devoted to more general subjects. And there are places for, con for speeches about issues that have a special impact on women at every conference we hold on everything, particularly when you think about things about science and education. As I said, uh, I don't think things have changed enough. I think within families, as far as belief systems go, women are still the first and the primary educators. And I don't mean to downgrade the role of men at all. That, in fact, is probably one of the things that's wrong historically in traditional families. However, uh, I, think that, I think that secular organizations, if you want more women, I think that they're going to have to address this. And I think the reason there aren't very many men here is not because this conference isn't welcoming to men, it's that men in general in the secular movement are not particularly interested in these issues, if that, except for the guys who are here, who obviously are. Uh, but, but I think that this is a problem. Uh, Ron Lindsay, the current director of the Center for Inquiry, is the first person running the Center for Inquiry who has ever recognized that this is a problem. And, and I do think that these things don't happen overnight. I definitely think that the, uh, Paul Kurtz, for example, was one of the most egalitarian, non-sexist people I ever knew. But he was a philosopher, and most of the people he hired at the Center for Inquiry back when he founded it in 1976 were philosophers. Philosophy has been an academic discipline that is very hostile to women. In institutions, people tend to hire people you know, from the same fields they hired them from. I think that is changing, but, but there is a long way to go. But just as the gender gap in politics is going to be a problem, it's going to be a problem in our movement too if, it's being if, if this is perceived as something for smart ass nerd guys. Uh, you know, I, somebody said to me it was quite interesting. Uh, it, was a, it was a woman at the speech I gave in Grand Rapids a couple weeks ago. She said, you know, when I look at, when I look at and, and that was, by the way, it was an event which was 75% men. 
but it was an event, it was a community event. Uh, this woman said, you know, I think of a lot of, a lot of the guys in the secular movement, they affect me the way Mark Zuckerberg affects me when I look at them. I just want to smack that smile off their face. <laughs> that, and I, I don't offer that as any sort of a science or evidence-based comment. <laughs> But I feel the same way about Mark Zuckerberg, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this last one is just a general, will your original speech in its entirety be published? We know you had to race through it today. Well, I, I can't answer that. Uh, if, if you're willing to share it, we can certainly make it available. I will, well, I, I, I'm not willing to share it in its present form. Okay. I, will, I will, however, edit it and, and make it available. Because when I write out speeches, they're not anything I would put into print. But I will, be, I, will be happy, I will be happy to clean up the bad punctuation and spelling and make it available. <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, you've all hopefully noticed we're filming and recording this, so you'll be able to see some of these sessions later on. Can we have and one more question? I don't have another question. Oh. Anybody have another question? Is it written? To, uh, well, we have two minutes. Come on, one more. One more. I think you were the first person I heard. Uh, um, can you talk about a, uh, building a secular atheist community and why that is, I've seen it denigrated a lot, and I think some of that is related to the fact that the people who do it are considered girly? <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Becker. Yeah. I'm the director of outreach for the Center for Inquiry, and I am in no. charge of, and I've never been described as girly. Uh, <laughs> Susan? Know, that, that is actually a good question. Now, I haven't heard that, uh, but I do think there, there are prejudices, prejudices about women affect men, too. I do think that, that there is something about I, I have often I have often heard, for instance, oh, they're just you know they're just a bunch of gays too. I think this has to do particularly with 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 the idea that uh, that, that it's kind of intellectual and we all know that's gay and nerdy and uh, something like that. But I don't think that I don't think that the perception of men is the reason that there's great difficulty in building secular atheist communities. Uh, I think that there, the places where I've seen the strongest secular atheist communities are places where they're a minority. For example, in Grand Rapids, where I spoke, they have probably the most vibrant chapter I've ever seen of the Center for Inquiry. Well, Grand Rapids is historically a very conservative religious town. And what happens in places like that when an active secular organization with young leadership, but by the way, they do have very equal male and female leadership in that chapter, comes in is, is that all of the people who aren't religious find a place where they can go to have somebody to talk to who thinks like themselves. This is much less of a draw in places like Washington and New York, where a lot of your friends think like you do, and it's not a huge, enormous problem to find somebody to talk to, which is obviously, well, you know, one of the main, one of the main community values of churches is just people, you know, get together with like-minded people. That is a problem in places in the country where people don't feel that need, but also, the other thing churches do is they sponsor a lot of things that people want to be involved in. Now, I know that there are many secular people who are trying to change this, but the fact is, is that secular organizations are not as deeply involved in various kinds of charitable volunteer work as churches are, just to name one thing that people might want to be involved in. Uh, now this might have to do with the girly thing too. Uh, a lot of churches provide all kinds of dating mechanisms, particularly temples. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of reasons that, that young people in New York I know who aren't religious at all join temples is they want to meet a Jewish guy. And that strikes them as one of the best ways to do it. Uh, meeting, meeting, meeting a secular guy uh, it's not so easy in, in, in the secular movement, partly because women so much outnumber the men. It's kind of like going to a women's college to me, you know, uh, uh, men so outnumber the women, but they tend to be married. And so that the kind of dating function of churches, and I'm not saying that this is something that secular organizations should do, but I think more than anything what's needed to build a secular community 
is for local secular groups to be more involved in things around education, around local education. I'm thinking, for instance, of the wonderful defeat of the intelligent design uh, curriculum up in Dover, Delaware. In that place, women were really involved in, in Dover, Pennsylvania, excuse me. Uh, in that case, a lot of women were deeply involved in that. And you are going to attract more of a secular community of women, of people whose lives are very busy with families if you offer outreach on activities that they would naturally be involved in anyway. Okay. Thank you very I know, much. We're done. <laughs>